Do you love what you do? Do you love your work? Hey, I'm Mark Hunter, the Sales Hunter. Today's episode, we got the Chief Encouragement Officer of Compete Every Day. Who is that? That's Jake Thompson. He's going to be joining us right after, well, we roll the video. But before I get the video, do you really love what you do? Do you love your work? Because I'll tell you what, I do, and I know Jake does too. He'll be on right after this. You're listening to the Sales Hunter Podcast with Mark Hunter where the focus is to help you as a salesman sell with confidence and integrity. And now here's your host. Yes, the Chief Encouragement Officer at Compete Every Day. Jake, great to have you on. This, You know, this is appropriate. We're recording this on a Friday afternoon in the summer when people are saying, oh, I want to go do something else but work. But no, you and I are pounding it back, making it happen. We sure are. You got to you gotta love the work. You got to take an opportunity every day to get a little bit better, even if it's a Friday afternoon in the summer. Every day is a chance to that get better. Like that sounds like a song. That sounds like a song, right? right? <laughs> it right? does. Originally, you don't want me singing it, but hey, it does sound like one. Originally done by the Moody Blues in the 70s. No, no, it's okay. No, that's okay. That was before your time. So anyway, before my time too. Anyway. Hey, uh, so really, Chief Encouragement Officer. Did that sound weird when you came up with that title? Not at all. Not at all. Because oh, when I, I started, it. when I started the company 12 years ago, I was selling t-shirts out of the trunk of my car with just this mission to encourage people to stop waiting, stop sitting on the sidelines, start taking action in their life. And encouragement was the one thing that I felt like stuck because what is it? Inspiring courage. What's courage? Doing the thing that scares you. Anyway, that's a mic drop. That's a mic drop moment. But I want to go back to it. Were they your t-shirts and was it your car? It was my car. It was my t-shirts. I had been spending a few years as a consultant in the marketing space after what I thought was my dream career ended up not being and leaving it. That was 2008. We remember the recession. I hey, laughed hey. that I had a, go ahead. You can't, you can't use that word on this show. Oh yeah. Sorry. It's what well, it, the <laughs> definition keeps changing. Uh, okay. I, I had a, I, you know, I had an MBA in sports business. I had work experience at the Dallas Cowboys for a sports agency and I couldn't even get a job at Best Buy working holiday hours. And so I was like, I got to do something. And I started reaching out to my network and said, here's where I think I can add value to you. Give me a shot. Started small, started free built that up, had a pretty successful consulting practice as a young single guy living in Dallas and was incredibly unfulfilled. And I was still carrying the weight of letting fear talk me out of going after goals and asking for sales and doing those things that we need to do to grow our career and lives. I said, what would it look like if someone started competing with themselves to face that fear? And the message resonated. And so after eight months of tinkering and trying and saying, how do I actually get this message out? My best friend said, hey, you should look at t-shirts. There's a company out of Boston called Life is Good. They do $120 million a year at the time with a simple slogan and a stick figure guy, ironically named Jake. He said, I think you can do that. And so I printed a bunch of t-shirts that said compete every day, sold them out of the back of my car behind a CrossFit gym in Dallas to anybody that would listen, and then said, hey, let's figure out how to actually build a brand. And that was I where the story began. I love, I lo there's so much what you said because... You sold the t-shirts, but you didn't sell them on a street corner. You went to a gym and you sold them there. Yeah, that was where I was working out. And yeah, it's it okay. An audience of people. So I just started CrossFit about a year before. You're wearing t-shirts, cycling through t-shirts. Everybody's buying a gym shirt or something that's like, hey, I work out. I'm active. I belong to this. So I was like, it seems like a really good fit because that model at its core was competing with yourself against the clock. And I saw it as being someone who'd been competitive in sports my whole life, who for a while had a very unhealthy relationship with competition because I lived in comparison versus actually competition. I saw it as a new opportunity to reframe that perspective with me for life outside the gym. The gym just happened to be a really great space to start marketing and testing and seeing, okay, does this fit? And when it did, then the conversation shifted of, okay, you're doing it there. How are you competing with your career, your life? What are you doing in that? And that's really where the avenues started to develop that set us on course for what we do today. 
Wow. So there's so much what you said. First of all, I mean, I, I got to come back to a very basic sales principle. You know, you knew where your audience was. You knew who would benefit most. And that's yeah. where you sold your T-shirts. That's perfect. But here's the whole thing. And, and I love this. We compete against ourselves. I mean, Dang. that's our biggest competitor is ourselves. It is. I, I mean, mean we, we don't think about it, though, right? In sales, no. we're always like, it's everyone else. I'm worried about oh, this yeah. person, that person. But we don't control anybody else. I, I had a conversation the other day with a person who was totally down on himself because he was sitting there comparing himself to everyone else. And, and, and it's easy for us to all do this, but, but really it's just women. The guy had tremendous skills, tremendous assets. Use them, use them. I mean, you know, it's, it's why, why do we suffer in not realizing that our number one competitor is ourselves, which really think about it, that should be easy to control, right? I mean, hey, hello. It should be should be human nature, right? Human nature yeah. is all about comparison. If we go back generations, the idea was, I want to make sure that I'm not the least person in our tribe, community, society, because I could be ostracized. I could be left out. And, and community was so important early on. Now though, we still have that mentality to where we're living in comparison, even from a, a happiness and the study of happiness standpoint, people would rather do just better than their neighbors than anything else. Like that's where we judge our happiness. Did I get more sales than my coworker? Not, did I get the most sales I possibly could get? And that's where we struggle. So we live in this constant state of comparison, measuring up because we feel like we, we need it to belong. But what I found is it's a really unhealthy place to live because we don't control them. We also set our bar on a very different target. And the, the best comparison I have from a sports perspective is imagine you're born with NBA level talent. You can play at the National Basketball Association. You can make millions of dollars. But in high school, you don't actually care about becoming your best. You just want to be better than that one other kid who's in the same position. That same kid that if they were lucky might have an opportunity to walk on at a junior college. They're not going to play division one, division two. They don't have that level of ability. And so instead of every day working hard, loving that process of improvement to become your best, you just try to do a little bit better than them. And what happens to that player with NBA talent? They never realize their potential because they never unlocked what they were capable of because they set a target that was so much smaller than that. So what you're saying, in order for us to love our work, we really have to love ourselves. Is this 100%. what you're saying? hundred percent because it, it opens everything up. I think it opens up your entire career, your, your personal life. Think about it. We're both speakers. We both do work in the sales space. If I looked at you as my competitor, then you and I wouldn't have the conversations over coffee that we've had. Okay. I show, would be, the show is ending right now. We want to say Jake for being on the show today. We can come back. Yeah, yeah. We, we'd be threatened. Right. right but right. when I, when I understand I'm not in competition with you, I'm, I'm with me. I can no. then look at you and say, Mark, what do you do so well? You're the king of prospecting. You run an incredible podcast. How are you doing these things? How can I learn from you? How can I do it my own way? Because I don't see us as competition. In fact, what I see is the better you do, the better it forces me to do better. Raising our game, a rising tide raises all ships. And more than anything, it weeds out the people who don't want to do the work or, or, her, or are only in it for themselves. Okay, and I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna do a little stair step here. A, okay. you can't love your work until you first love yourself. You can't love yourself until you first see life as being one of abundance versus one of scarcity. Do you buy into that? Hundred percent. There's enough wins out there for all of us, and that's there hard is. because we're trained in sales, right? It's cutthroat. Nobody else don't talk to anybody else. But I've learned the most in my industry. And in my work, from talking to peers, from having relationships with people that I want to see succeed, because the better they do, the better it forces me. I always go back to the idea in sports of if you're so worried about a teammate doing really well that you want them to do okay, just not as good as you, then what you do is you're cheating your team of what you could be because you're selling yourself short. And we do it in organizations all the time. We don't want to help that new salesperson come in because we feel threatened they could take our awards. They may do better with leads than we do. They can take our opportunities versus we're here to serve the client. 
to provide solutions for people, the better they do, all that says is, oh, I'm not threatened by them. I'm challenged of how can I improve what I do and what I control so I can keep pace or stay ahead. Okay. Now we, we got to unpack this because then how does somebody move to this attitude, this belief of abundance versus scarcity, believing in themselves so they can love their work? Yeah. How, so does, a couple some, of, how does somebody get into that, that mindset? So first is awareness, being aware of where you're feeling the threats, where you're feeling that tension. When a coworker starts celebrating a successful sale, where are you feeling it? Are you feeling it because you felt like you deserve that and they got it and you didn't? Like introspection is kind of the key piece of it. But then it's what am I doing every single day to check the box of things within my control? And, and when I talk about loving the work, you don't love everything, right? I don't always love going and dealing with TSA and sitting on an airplane at 5.30 in the morning to go do really? a keynote. Come on. I, do, Come on. I don't always love that. I don't love driving through DFW looking for a parking spot sometimes. But I love what I do. And I love the process of finding people that I can serve and serving those people. And not just, hey, give me the paycheck. Let me close the deal. I love the whole work process. Love doesn't mean happiness. Sometimes it's challenging. And so for me, what I do is I game it. And that's what I teach a lot of my clients as well is how can you create a simple scorecard that everything within your control on a given week, how many times you're picking up the phone and calling, how many times you're following it, how many times, heck, you're spending 20 minutes on a walk in your car, listening to an audiobook, this podcast, something that's going to improve you. How can I every day, if I take these little bitty actions that move my business and life forward, score myself on them each week, look at my score, say, what did I do well? Where am I going to do better next week? How am I going to do better? Then I've all of a sudden, I've got that baseline and target, just like we do with sales numbers, right? We set a goal. We start at zero. We see how we did. We evaluate. We work the process. Most of us just focus on the sale and not the actual process piece of oh. picking up the phone, researching, all of that. And if we start scoring ourselves with that, we start making a game. We start making a game. We start having fun. Yeah. I mean, the sale is only because of the activity. You got to do the activity. I mean, this is like points on a scoreboard. They just don't appear. There are plays that are run, things that are executed. That's what puts points on the board. And, and sometimes you run a play not to score. You run a play to set up another play. Fine. You run a run right. to set up a play action. Right, which, which is totally fine. And and I know you love the book Atomic Habits, right? I do. I'm sure you've read it. I mean- that book is gold because again, what you're talking about is just doing those little things every day. And if we're dedicated and focused, I had lunch lunch today with a couple of people and we were talking about that, how if you stay in the game long enough, it's amazing what kind of level of success you can have if you stay in the right game. But the challenge is too many people look at somebody else's game and they want to jump into their game versus staying in their, in their own personal game. Yeah. game. Or they jump too far ahead. If you're right. brand new to, to sales and prospecting and you're listening to this show to learn, jumping to where somebody is at year 10 with all of their established relationships and network, that's a dangerous place to be in because you're trying to, to skip 10 years of work and cultivation and learning. What you could do is say, hey, what are things you wish you'd done at the beginning? But then to find somebody who's two to three years ahead of you who's a little bit closer to that gap and start learning about their activities and what they're doing to, to cultivate relationships, to, to build where it's not cold outreach as we laughed at breakfast. It's, it's warm. You got to know somebody, you understand you can deliver that solution. That's where that piece comes. Everybody wants to shortcut the work and go right to the sale. They want to close the deal on the very first conversation with somebody They're They're all about that. But Bill Walsh, the famous San Francisco 49ers coach said it best. You win your championship trophies in practice. You yeah. only pick them up on game day. We earn the sale over the course of prospecting, building the relationship, getting to know somebody, loving all of that. The sale is just the outcome piece. Yeah, yeah but but again, it, it, it's difficult for salespeople and anybody to get because again, yeah. it can be so... It's one call after another. Nothing's going anywhere. No progress is being made. I, I, it's not working. It's not, how can I love myself when nobody else loves me? Yada, yada, yada. And we talk ourselves into this death spiral. Yeah. And we see salespeople do it all the time. And then they say, oh, there, there's nothing to love here. Again, 
how, you know, what, you know, I would say remove your identity from the outcome of that call. Oh, okay. Changing now, okay. The, Unpack yeah. that. Unpack that. So we are not what we do. A lot of times we confuse that. We believe that if we were to call someone and ask for a sale or get to know, and they say no, that that no means we're failure. It could mean we don't have the right person we're talking to. This is not the right time. We need to find somebody else. We need to change how we, like, it's not a, a personal dig at us. And I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of times we get so tied up in our work as sales professionals, instead of I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a leader, I'm a mom, I'm a spouse, and I do sales. I provide solutions for people. So removing that identity piece and then reframing it. It's not, hey, somebody doesn't want to buy me. It's, I need to find if this is the right person or how I can better tell them that I understand the problem they have and I have a solution. I just want to help. That's where I talk to people. It's like, if you come into every call and conversation of how can I just help and add value to you, it removes this thing of, of fear of rejection over me as a person. Then you go through that process of, I say it's more of being a scientist than a college student taking a final exam. If you're a college student, that final exam, you're thinking, oh my God, my degree's on this, my future's on this, everything weighs on this. If I don't pass it, I fail. Oh my gosh, I'm a failure. What happens? A scientist looks at a, an opportunity and says, what's my hypothesis? Well, I think this is the right person to talk to about this solution. Let me test it. They test it. Was I right? Was I wrong? Okay, well, if, if I wasn't right, what do I need to change? I need to change how I open the conversation. I need to change the angle that we talk about the problem. I need to change the person I talk about. They don't attach themselves to a science experiment failing. They just said, this hypothesis doesn't work. What do I need to change to keep going? And that's where we really get caught as sales professionals is we look at everything as a final exam versus the discovery process that a scientist go through, which allow us to remove not only our identity, but every single, every single call, every single conversation, it's always about afterwards. What did I do really well here that I need to repeat? What's something I can do better? And how am I going to do that better? Ooh, I, I, I like what you said. Here's a theory that I've got. People who don't love what they do, they look at success as a destination. I look at success as a journey. 100%. Each, each day is a journey. Yeah. Uh, how do you buy in that? Because we'll say you got a sales job and and you're working for it. I mean, it's just, it's just, it just isn't going right. How do you get yourself up for making those 65 calls a day or 30 calls a day or whatever it might be? How do you, you get play, yourself up? A couple of things on that. So I think you play a game with yourself. Mm -hmm. Like every call you set a goal for that call that's not, I got to close a deal. And you start scoring yourself every day and you challenge yourself of how can I improve my score tomorrow? The second piece of that is really understanding. I would just say, look at society. How many people have succeeded? They've gotten their sales number, their award. They've won a Super Bowl. They've won an Academy Award. They've gotten the quote mountaintop and they're incredibly unfulfilled. Oh, I, I see that time. And I, I, I talk to those people all the time. Yeah. It's because it's because the outcome that we attach so much into is not actually the reward. It's as you said, it's the journey. It's the process. It's loving that waking up every day and saying, who, whose business do I get to help today? Whose lives do I get to help today? And you're not always going to feel chipper. You're not always going to have this smile, but attitude is a choice. So is effort and so are actions. So if you become someone every day who says, I'm going to choose my attitude to have fun in the work embrace this process and help others. Other people find that contagious, especially if you're the leader of an organization, if you're managing people, people want to work with other people who have fun doing the work, doing hard things. I, I always think about, I went to dinner two weeks ago with my wife. We tried a new restaurant, local spot, didn't think anything about it until we sat down. Our waitress, I think she had more fun than anybody in that entire restaurant. She was excited to talk about this special Manhattan cocktail they had. And she told us about this dinner stuff. And man, we were in between a couple appetizers. So she brought us a sample of one. She just loved what she did. And I thought, you know what? The food was okay, but I'll come back to this restaurant anytime and sit in her section because she has fun doing work and I want to support that. I love it. It's the, it. it's the experience. Donna's is jumping in here, here yeah. saying, I love what I do. Every day in sales is challenging, but exciting. You're right. I mean, it's not all it's not all lollipops and puppy dogs. No, it, but you, easy doesn't make us proud. 
Ooh, easy doesn't make it. That's a mic. I like that. I like that, dude. Sounds like you got a few. You got. You probably got that on a t-shirt, don't you? I, I I did have it on a shirt at one point. Yeah. Think about it. The most challenging things you've ever done in your life have been the most rewarding. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's yeah. how we have to look at the sales. Yeah. The process hey, of loving the work. Absolutely cool. Absolutely great conversation because and and one fi- one final question. You and I have a little difference of opinion about what time okay. to get up in the morning. You know, and I saw your post. Ye- I saw your post yesterday. Yeah, yesterday on LinkedIn, and <clears throat> I admit I, I woke up this morning on my own about four fifteen, and I got up about four twenty five. Uh, I'm just an early morning person because I believe I can get a lot of stuff done. Yep. I had a breakfast at seven thirty. Needed to get a bunch of stuff done, and you raised a good point. What's the point of getting up early if you waste your time? Absolutely. I, I and the, the whole thing sparked for me because of Twitter and all these people of like. If you're not up at 5 a.m., you're not doing it. You're not going to win all of this. And I think it's different for everybody. If you have a late night job, you can't get up at 5 a.m. I also think everybody's schedules that you look at of like, oh, I wake up at 5.30 and here's what I do. And I go to bed at 7 or 8. If you shift those two hours, you can still accomplish it. What I care about is how do you use your work? How do you use the time you're awake? Because there's a lot of people that are getting up at five. They may work out, they get into the office early, but the first thing they do is they get in their inbox and then they're scrolling social media throughout the day. And then they're just casually talking to everybody in the office versus making calls and they may stay late. And we tend to, as a society, reward those people for being the quote grinders and the hustlers, but they're not actually that productive versus the people are like, I have this much time. This is what I'm going to do. How am I going to attack it? This one, I'm going to get it done. And so I'm for whatever your morning routine is. If it's as early as yours, I usually am up at 530 or six in the morning. But if you don't get up that early, if you're like, hey, I get up at seven, but here's my day and here's how I structure it. And you attack it relentlessly. That's all I care about. It's not about the time you wake up. It's about the what you do with the time you're awake. It's not the hours you have. It's how you use the hours you have. Yeah. This is great. Hey, Jake, tell the audience, how do people get in touch with you? How do people follow you? You know, where are you at on social media, website? Thanks. Uh, personal place where I hang out the most is LinkedIn or Instagram. And my username is Jake Thompson Speaks on both of those channels. And then to learn more about us, just go to competeeveryday.com. Competeeveryday.com. I love the guy because you post some great stuff all the time out there. I'll appreciate you. Mark. Again, so it's good. So anyway, hey, you've been listening to the Sales Hunter podcast. What is it all about? It's about giving you insights you can run with and use right away. Each week, you get two episodes, one a short one for me, a short topic, just five, six minutes talking about one single thing. Second episode is a longer one like what you've heard here today from Jake Thompson. What is it all about? It's about helping you become the salesperson you're capable. Why? Because I want to help you see and achieve what you didn't think was possible. Thank you, Jake, for being on the show. My name is Mark Hunter, The Sales Center. You've been listening to The Sales Center Podcast.